Hey, good morning. Just wanted to do a quick sort of addendum to a post we did uh, yesterday on the uh, concerns about replacement theology, the idea of uh, the church replacing Israel. A question came out of that um, having to do with Romans 11.25, where Paul talks about blindness has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And the question had to do with when does that happen? What does it mean when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in? When does that take place? Uh, let me explain what that is first. Um, and, uh, you know, when Paul talks about that idea of blindness having come upon Israel, it's really part of a larger, fascinating discussion uh, or discourse that Paul gives on uh, the idea of Israel having been uh, the original branches on the vine, that messianic hope and promise, God's purposes and plans for the redemption of mankind. Israel f uh, was the first branches uh, on the vine. However, they have been uh, removed for a time uh, and the Gentiles, or the church nowadays, the church which started off uh, being predominantly Jewish and then eventually became predominantly Gentile uh, over time, um, these branches, these Gentile branches, were grafted into the vine. And again, we spent a little time talking about this yesterday, uh, or in the last post, depending on when you're watching this, but the last post, <coughs> where we talked about how in Christ there is no longer male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, such and so on. Um, the idea is that in Christ, in this body that has been brought together between Jew and Gentile, as Paul explains in Ephesians 2.14, uh, and around that, all around that passage there, um, the idea that the distinctions between people in regard to salvation disappears. Uh, however, there is a different element in which there is a very clear distinction between Israel and the church, and that has to do with eschatology. Uh, there are many promises given to Israel throughout the Old Testament uh, that, that helped to build the messianic hope, the idea that Messiah would one day rule and reign in a kingdom on earth, overthrowing her enemies, uh, putting uh, Israel at the head and no longer at the tail. Uh, all of these wonderful uh, promises that the nation has hung on and that, that God reaffirms uh, throughout much of the Old Testament and the minor prophets and the major prophets, um, all of these areas in the Old Testament where this, this messianic hope of a kingdom here on earth, the rejoining of the, two tri the, the 12 tribes, the northern and southern tribes of Israel into one kingdom, one stick, as it would say in Ezekiel and, uh, and such. But the idea here that, um, that these things would, uh, would take place physically here on the earth is something that has been part of the messianic hope in Israel for her entire existence, basically. And so the question comes up now in modern theology, especially in regard to things like amillennialism, which again, we spent some time talking about Augustine's influence on that, um, and, uh, and it's under undercurrent in regard to replacement theology. Um, the modern thinking on that, especially again, in regard to things like amillennialism, is that Israel's promises were forfeited when she rejected her Messiah, and therefore the church has sort of embraced and, and received now those promises. That's not true. Again, that's a very dangerous theology. Um, I didn't go this far yesterday, but I was about to, and I just kind of moved on, but I will interject it here. Uh, that replacement theology um, uh, really uh, is responsible in, in a lot of ways for much of the persecution that has happened to the Jews, including, I would include the Holocaust there, and the church's silence by and large throughout that ordeal, that incredibly horrible uh, treatment of God's chosen people, those whom God calls the apple of his eye, and those to whom he has given irrevocable promises, um, as we see in, in uh, uh, again, in Romans 11, the idea that the promises uh, that God has made to Israel are irrevocable. And so therefore, and what were those promises? Promises to Abraham that he would have a lineage, a descendancy uh, that would go on, that uh, there would never cease to be, uh, eventually through David, there would never cease to be a king on the throne and all these kinds of things. But not only that, uh, as a matter of fact, if that's all the promises were, then Paul's discussion on spiritual Israel, those who, are, uh, who receive Christ by faith are, this, are, are the seed of uh, Abraham by faith, all these discussions that, that Paul shares in Romans and Galatians on these topics, if the promise was simply to the physical and spiritual lineage of Abraham, then you probably would be able to make a pretty strong case, and it might be hard not to, uh, not to sort of succumb to that idea entirely.
However, the promises that God made to Abraham were not just for his lineage, but also for the land itself. There is a national element to this promise. The church was never promised Israel, the, the land of Canaan, uh, but Abraham and his descendants were promised the land of Canaan. As a matter of fact, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, we see this idea that the land is something that God holds sacred both to himself and for his people. And so therefore, it's not just that Abraham has all this physical lineage and also spiritual lineage because Abraham, uh, you know, was justified by, you know, his faith and that kind of thing. And so therefore, those who believe uh, are justified like believing Abraham. If it was just the, the people that were in view, those who would believe, again, that would be one thing. But that's not all that was in view. The land itself was also in view, which means God has a purpose for his people in the land that he gave them. And this is what we, uh, this is a, a fundamental uh, hallmark pillar element of the idea of recognizing the distinction between Israel and the church. Yes, nobody is saved outside of a salvation by faith through, through uh, you know, by God's grace through faith. This is again, as we said last time, not just a New Testament idea. This actually permeates the Old Testament as well. Uh, it is the lens by which all discussion of salvation needs to be understood, uh, both in the Old and New Testament. Otherwise, you are left having to defend the idea that there may have been some who were saved by their obedience to the law. But Paul makes that abundantly clear, makes it, makes it abundantly clear that that has never in fact happened. The only person who ever lived out the, uh, the you know, righteously, completely without fail, was Christ himself. And so therefore, how could you be saved any other way but by faith? And so anyway, that's again something we talk about quite a bit. But getting back around to the question here about the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, I kind of laid out a little bit of a uh, a base of a uh, sequence of events yesterday, but I realized in going back over it that I probably could have been a little bit more clear on that, and that may have actually uh, answered this question in the in the post yesterday. But let me go back over because I I don't think I was as clear as I could have been. Uh, as far as how eschatology seems to play out uh, in regard to God's dealing with Israel and the Church, and then again with Israel, um, this is how it appears to me in Scripture to play out. Uh, Israel in the Old Testament, all the way up until the time of Christ, was the instrument that God was using to bring his truth to the world. To them were entrusted the oracles of God, as, as Paul would say in the early chapters of Romans. Much benefit in every way to be a Jew. The idea that they had the manifest presence of God in their midst, they were given the law, uh, the promises, the fathers, all of these things were the benefit given to Israel. And, and that benefit remains a benefit today. Uh, in part because it is that testimony ultimately that should lead them to Messiah. Jesus himself said that if you believed Moses, you'd believe in me, right? He told the Pharisees that. And so the idea that they were given these things should be a huge benefit in helping them to see the truth of who their Messiah is, of course, Messiah, Yeshua, uh, their Mashiach. And so now, um, the Jews were the vehicle through which God was intending to reach the world throughout the Old Testament era until the coming of Messiah, whom Israel did in fact reject during his first coming. Now recognize that this was not something unforeseen by God, but rather instead, is as, and this is a big part of what Paul has to, uh, uh, to speak about in Romans 9 through 11, in particular chapter 11, uh, the idea that the rejection of Christ by the Jews and their being set aside that the gospel might go to the Gentiles uh, was, was all part of the plan of God. And ultimately, this is all part of the manifold wisdom of God that Paul just, his mind is blown at the end of Romans 11, where he just breaks into worship over the magnificent thinking and purposes and plans of God. Well, ultimately, the idea is, is that Israel rejects her Messiah, and so therefore she is set aside for a time, and her rejection opens the door to the Gentiles. The Gentiles not only get saved, but become an instrument of God to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Again, read Romans 9 through 11, where God uses us, the church, to provoke Israel to jealousy. How is it that they can, in fact, have a relationship with God through somebody who claims to be the Jewish Messiah that we've rejected? It's just this mind-rattling thing that they have to reconcile and work through. But that being said, as a matter of fact, uh, because of that provoking the jealousy, there were and have been and remain to this day many Jews who do come to faith in Christ as a result of this. So we are now in a period of time where the gospel 
is running through the earth and people are getting saved by faith in Christ. Something that in the Old Testament there was anticipation of, but now has come to fruition. The coming of Christ to ultimately take our sin upon himself, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And so anybody who comes to faith today does so by putting their trust directly in the person of Christ, and they now become part of what we call the church. If you put your trust in Jesus today, no matter what your ethnic background, uh, and this again is where I realized I didn't spend enough time on this point last time, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm adding this as an addendum to yesterday. Um, but anybody who comes to faith in Christ today immediately becomes, by virtue of the indwelling and sealing of the Holy Spirit, they become part of this entity called the church. Now the church will only be here for a certain period of time. Uh, and that period of time, it gets us right back to the question, that period of time is until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Uh, in other words, there is a final Gentile to get saved that will ultimately end the period of time that we call the Age of Grace or the Church Age. The Age of Grace might be a little bit um, uh, uh, inaccurate. Uh, I would call it the Church Age. The Age of Grace has always technically been around. I know that's going to drive dispensationalists out of their minds. But to say that uh, that anyone has ever been saved outside of the grace of God is to misunderstand the gospel. There's really no other way to put it. Uh, and so the idea that, um, that we call us the Age of Grace might be a little bit of a misnomer, but I'll call it the Church Age instead. Well, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about a point at which Jesus will come and catch up his bride in the air and snatch her away. Uh, the harpazo, the harpazo gametheia, the idea of the snatching away or the rapture, uh, rapturo in the Latin, rapture in English, harpazo gametheia, and I think this is the full term in the Greek in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, but the idea that we will be caught up to meet our bridegroom in the air. He sweeps his bride off her feet as it were, and, and as Jesus promised in John 14, he's going to prepare a place for us that where he is, we might be also. And that, that's when that's what that rap, the rapture is all about there. The idea that he snatches us away. Now he snatches us away before the wrath of God comes out upon the earth. Again, Revelation 6 through 19. Uh, without getting into the whole thing again, I believe the wrath of God starts with the breaking of the first seal. Again, there are those that debate that and say that it happens later, but that's my position. That's where I stand. That would be a pre-tribulational, uh, pre-millennial position. And so, um, so that being said, the rapture happens. We are taken out of the world because God is about to bring judgment on the world. However, after the church is gone, you'll notice, as we mentioned last time, that Revelation 6 through 19 all of a sudden takes on a profoundly Jewish flavor. The book goes from the chapters 2 and 3, the church being spoken to directly, to all of a sudden when chapter 6, we don't see the church anymore, uh, arguably after chapter 4, but for sure by chapter 6, we don't see the church anymore. Uh, and it almost begins to read much like an Old Testament book. It starts sounding like Daniel. Matter of fact, there are direct references to Daniel. And so much of the Old Testament ultimately uh, finds, uh, finds a revisitation in the book of Revelation. And so this is the reason for this is because the church is not in view. Israel's in view. God once again, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, God once again begins to work through Israel. We begun to see that happening when Israel came back in the land in 1948 in fulfillment of, of uh, Ezekiel 37. We will still see Ezekiel 30 and 39, which again is God's dealing uh, on behalf of Israel. Um, Daniel's 70th week, which is a period of time that we call the tribulation in New Testament uh, vernacular. The idea that, well, and Old Testament really, but the idea is really drawn from the Old Testament. But we typically refer to this period of time as the tribulation period, the great tribulation being the second half of that. Um, but the, the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation period, as it says in Daniel 9.24, leading into 9.27, when that 70th week is described, is a period of time where Israel is in focus, Daniel's people and the holy city. And so there are a lot of passages that help us understand that the final days, that last seven year period of human history of man's dominion on the earth before the return of Christ to establish his kingdom, as we see in Revelation 19, 11 through 20, verse six, uh, that period of time focuses specifically on the Jews. Now, that doesn't mean the Gentiles don't get saved during that period of time, and I'll get back to how that connects with, with Romans 11, 25. 
Um, but the peer, but that period of time is predominantly marked by God's working in and through Israel. The 144,000 witnesses in Revelation 7 and 14. These are uh, these are 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that are named again in Revelation 7, noticeably absent are Dan and Ephraim. But we do recognize uh, that. Uh, um, and again, there's actually lots and lots of genealogies where the 12 tribes are mentioned. Uh, but it is significant. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other thing. But anyway, the 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, equaling 144,000, that seem to have an evangelistic witness in mind as they go about. Uh, the next thing we see after that mentioned in chapter 7 is these uh, this this gathering of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping around the throne and all of this. And so there seems to be a connection here of an evangelistic effort uh, during their period of time. Um, but again, this speaks of a predominantly Jewish thing. When Jesus returns in, in uh, Revelation 19 and establishes the Millennial Kingdom in Revelation 20, it is in fulfillment of the promises to Israel. Uh, in, uh, in Ezekiel, um, we see references again in chapter uh, is it 37 where it makes uh, reference to, did I mention, did I say Ezekiel 36 before? Ezekiel 36 through 39 is a passage you'll want to read together, but I think it was in Ezekiel 37 that the land, uh, uh, Israel comes back, the dry bones are brought back to life. But in that, right in that, throughout that section, we see here that David will sit on the throne again. That may be a literal reference to David and not just sort of through the Messiah. It may be that David himself has a very prominent place in the millennial kingdom when it's established, sitting alongside of Christ, alongside of the saints who will rule and reign. Um, there's, there's so much throughout the scripture that describe a physical, literal uh, kingdom being established on the earth with Christ as its head, ruling with a rod of iron. Um, these passages only make sense when you take them at face value. When you try to spiritualize it, it becomes wildly subjective. Uh, and as we mentioned and often mentioned, that's just not an appropriate way to, uh, to build your hermeneutic or your way of interpreting scripture. So um, let me, before I wrap this up, taking it, wrap this up and taking it for a landing, let me come back to uh, uh, Romans 11.25. And the idea that Gentiles get saved after the rapture of the church. Um, people rightly ask and fairly ask, well, if the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, as Paul mentions, then how do Gentiles get saved after that? Well, let me, uh, let me speak to that. Now, like many things in Scripture, it's, it's not like there aren't difficulties with some passages, and so I can only present what I think is a logical answer to that question. Um, First off, in in, uh, in, Galatia, in uh, Romans 11.25, when it says the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, I used to think that that meant that the last Gentile that would ever get saved. That's not necessarily what it means. It just means that there is some number that God has, you know, has ordained that the last Gentile of that number of people will get saved. And shortly thereafter, we begin to see Daniel's 70th week come along and all of these other events that, that are contained in it. But the passage in Romans 11.25 doesn't necessarily mean that there are no more Gentiles that will ever get saved. Again, as we recognize from Revelation, it's, it's not that no more Gentiles will ever get saved. Um, there will be some who get saved during the, the uh, uh, period of time known as the Tribulation, as, as will many Jews get saved during that period of time. Uh, certainly when Christ returns and they look upon him whom they've pierced and they mourn over him in that, and then ultimately as Christ saves them from the wrath of Antichrist coming upon them in that final thrust to destroy them. Uh, Jesus returns, as we see in places like Psalm 2, again, Revelation 19, um, Zechariah, um, you know, the, when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives and all. Um, when he comes back and establishes his kingdom, there will be no unbelief in his authority, lordship, kingship, and all that. There will, however, by that point, have been many who put their faith in him. They put their trust in him as a savior. Um, and they will have to endure that period of time that remains. At whatever point they get saved, after the rapture of the church, they will have to endure the persecutions that come, the tribulation that comes, the great tribulation period as well, um, because they're just living in time and space, and they didn't come to faith until after the rapture of the church. So now in terms of distinction, we don't technically call these part of the church anymore because the church is gone. They're enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb and all these things. 
These who remain, the title that is generally given to them is what is called tribulation saints, and that's a fair title because they are those who are set apart and made holy, uh, sealed and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but yet they are born again after the church is gone. Uh, they come to faith the same way everybody came to faith. They're saved the same way everybody in history has been saved. That is by belief, by God, you know, through the, uh, you know, through the goodness of God's grace. So, but these are unfortunately left to have to endure this time of trouble uh, on the earth because they did not believe before the rapture happened, and so they do have to endure. That seems to be uh, the logical, reasonable, reasonable, and not necessarily unscriptural. Uh, answer to that question. It's it's a difficulty for sure, but I think that's a reasonable response to that idea. So when does the fullness of the Gentiles come in? I don't think it happens during the tribulation. I don't think it, um, because of where that passage is set in Paul's discussion about the church in Israel uh, in uh, Romans 11, uh, I do think that uh, the, the period of time that he would have in mind would be prior, uh, or would lead up to the rapture of the church and its exodus from uh, this world before the wrath of God is poured out. Um, but again, I don't think he's necessarily implying that no other Gentiles will ever get saved. Again, in eschatology, there is a broader picture in view. So um, so anyway, so my hope is that that helps to answer the question. Uh, my hope is to be a little briefer than this, but uh, I guess I should just stop apologizing for that. And if you're all are watching by now, you already know that I tend to be a little long-winded. So anyway, hopefully that answers the question. And hopefully that also fills in some blanks that I may have gone over a little too quickly in uh in the last post and so again um, i hope this is helpful so thanks for watching and listening and if you have any questions or comments or anything as always you're welcome to leave those in uh, our comment section on our youtube channel if you want to email me at info at calvarychapelfranklin.com i always enjoy reading your emails and responding uh, a lot of times i respond by virtue of doing a post uh, so feel free to share any questions or comments that you may have in that regard but uh, Father, we do thank you that there is in fact a plan for the last days and the last things that you have ordained for it, uh, for them. So I pray that Father, we would just for our part, continually be about your business here on earth, hand on the plow, uh, moving straight ahead, trudging uphill where necessary, enjoying the mountaintops, but working through the valleys uh, and all of the things that, that sort of are part of the experience of the follower of Jesus in our day uh, leading up to his coming. But as our hands are on the plow, we don't want to look back, but we do want to look up. And so we pray that, Father, you would always encourage within us a desire to know and uh, know you better, to walk with you with, uh, with intention, to let our lives be a living sacrifice, as Paul would have said in Romans 12. Uh, that, Father, we would lay ourselves on the altar as it were a living sacrifice, wholly given over to you. Uh, and let that be our spiritual act of worship to you. So, Father, we praise you and bless you for the hope that you've given us. We thank you that our sins are forgiven, we are redeemed, and one day we'll experience the fullness of that redemption when Christ comes and snatches us away and we're glorified and we, are sp we spend our eternity with him and with you. Thank you, Father, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the power that he gives to live this life today as we wait for that day. So, Father, thank you again. We love you, we bless you, and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.